we're going to look at 1 John chapter 5. Calvinists, they believe in a doctrine in which man does not have free choice, free will to get saved. They believe that it is not of his own ability or will, but that there must be a regeneration of the Holy Ghost first. So, uh, this is the signature picture that I will always draw with Calvinism. So obviously, God's pointing up his finger up in heaven. That's how they imagine him to be. And then boom, 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 boom. Takes over. He has no free choice. So his free choice is eliminated right here. Let's put will, because we're going to see a lot more of that as we cover this passage. So no to free choice right here. And the person has no choice, and if God wants to, he can spook him out and then put some kind of uh, mat, some power, like that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts to regenerate within him, and then, oh, then uh, it is not by my free will and free choice, it's his will. And because of God's will, I got saved. So the person can only believe on Jesus Christ after the regeneration. So they believe the Holy Ghost has to go, we're going to make you, we're going to make you born again. Regeneration. So once the Holy Ghost regenerates you, then you're able to believe on Christ for salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. So John is simply saying right here that we know a born-again Christian. Why? Because he believes on Jesus Christ for salvation. That's why we know he's a born-again Christian. But the Calvinists, see, it's very simple. That's how we take it as. If you're a Calvinist, you deliberately complicate, play philosophy, and then complicate the passage into some philosophical statement that the author did not even intend all that time. Okay, how does this prove Calvinism? You don't see that anywhere. They teach this. They teach that, see, when you're born again first, that's why you believed on Jesus Christ. Now, no one in their right mind thought of it in that kind of se sequence when they were reading it. They were just simply thinking, we know that the person's a born-again Christian because he believed on Jesus Christ for salvation. But then see, they say, wait a minute, okay, stop right there. What did you mean by that? Let's ponder that a little more. Let's complicate that. You said that this person is a born-again person because he believes on Jesus Christ for salvation. Okay. See, so because of this first, that's why we can say he believed on Jesus Christ for salvation. You might say, no, that's not what I meant at all. And the Calvinist says, no, that's what you meant. We're going to try to see this right here. Notice, whosoever believeth that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. They believe is born of God has to be first, that phrase. And the whosoever part has to be second. How do they come up with that nonsense? Okay, so here are a few passages that they will use to prove this nonsense. Let's look at the book of 1 John, please. 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 29. 1 John chapter 2, and we'll read verse 29. Notice their logic right here. So let's use all the Calvinist verses right here. Notice that this is born of God idea has to be first. And then the whosoever believeth or the whosoever does anything else has to be second. This is their order here. How do they come up with this idea, Pastor? If they have a biased belief already and they want to find a verse that can deliberately support it. See, you don't 
find this out by just reading the verse as it says with the simple, honest heart. No, it's when you already have a biased belief and you're deliberately trying to find a verse that can support your belief. And guess what? God will give it to you. Anyone can do that with any text when they already have a biased mind. Remember that. All right, 1 John 2.29. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. Okay, in other words, we know that this person is born of God because of his acts of righteousness. But, see, are you saying then that he had to do his acts of righteousness first to be born of God? No. no. What that means is, see, you're born of God first. That's why you do acts of righteousness. That's the same thing right here, see? Because you're born of God, that's why you believed on Jesus Christ for salvation. That's what the author John meant. we got to understand his mindset, and people don't read the context. So when you read the context, and you use proper exegesis, and with this eisegesis, and then if you take lessons from Judas White and Jeff Durbin and Apologia Studios and you know Greek and Hebrew and then you understand the historical timeline of the author's mentality and every time the author John mentioned about born of God, it shows in this kind of sequential format and... <laughs> okay, let's look at other passages. First John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. See, is born of God first or cannot sin first? See, it's because he's born of God first, that's why he cannot sin. Same thing with 1 John chapter 5, the Calvinists will argue. Because he's born of God first, that's why he believed Jesus is the Christ. You see that mentality? So they're going to use other verses on you. Uh, let's see, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Okay, so we saw chapter 3, verse 39. And then uh, 3 verse 9, excuse me, and then chapter 4 and verse 7. You know, it, I, I just, I, it makes sense. I think I'm going to be a Calvinist after this now. All right, let's look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. See that thing again? Everyone that loveth is born of God. Okay, because I loved another person, that's why I later became born of God? No, because I was born of God first, that's why I love another person. So this sequential order seems to make sense to Calvinists. Unless I'm born of God first, then I believe. Then I love the other person. Then I cannot sin. Uh, then I do righteousness. See that? That's their mentality right here. Okay, that's why if you look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, so I'm just going to go through this a little bit quickly. So that way we can close this up. But I'm going to write down every single time. That way it seems to support the Calvinist. Every time it mentions this, notice it supports this kind of sequence. That's why Calvinism seems very strong and persuasive. Remember this. Calvinists, they're not stupid with Scripture. You've got to remember that. You know why? Because they're used to deliberately playing with verses to support their biased belief. So they majored in doing that. Whereas you don't do that. The reason why is because you just honestly read as it says and you never deliberately read into the phrase that much that you found that kind of sequence in order. Okay, so let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we might argue, okay, because you're saved in Jesus Christ by faith, that's why you're born of God. But then the Calvinists, they'll say, well, slow down right here. Let's deliberately look into this a little further. It's deeper than what you think. No, it's simple. You're saved by faith. You're born of God. What the, what, what, let's look into that. Let's, 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 let's look deeper. There's a deeper meaning. I'm sure that's what the author was thinking when he wrote that. So they're saying right here, see, when you're... Notice right here that is born of God again, right? So is it because right here that they overcame the world, that because of their faith, then they later become born of God? No, because he's born of God first, that's why he can overcome the world. That's why he can have faith. 
See, that again supports the Calvinist logic again. Uh, the last one is 1 John 5.18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. See, again, you're born of God first. Holy Ghost regenerates you first, then you can what? Then you don't sin. See, it supports that kind of sequence. Okay, this is more simple than you think, and this is what I argued last week. You know what's very simple? The Apostle John, who's the author, he had a different mindset than this, this John right here. Okay, so John the Apostle was not stuck at home like this John over here, sitting down and saying, what did he mean by is born of God? No, he's using something simple like I mentioned to you before. Okay. You know what he's simply doing? Like any of us would simply say. How do you know that person's a born-again Christian? Because he believed on Jesus Christ for salvation, right? That's what we would say. Then all of a sudden, let's say that I interrupted you. What did you mean by that? You know what you just meant by that just now? You meant by that, that because he was born again first, that's why he believes on Jesus. And what would you say? You're, think, you're thinking, I did not mean that sequence at all. That's the key. See, they automatically insert sequence in this verse. John was not thinking sequence. Give me one verse in this whole book where John deliberately said sequence, timeline. This is first, then that is next. Nowhere. He was giving a simple statement. Okay, let's look at all of these verses. Example, okay? Oh, I know that person's a born-again Christian. Why? Because I see him passing out tracts, coming to church, reading the Bible, so that person must be a born-again Christian. When I say that, what are you thinking? Are you thinking like a Calvinist, or are you thinking... Like a simple statement, oh, because of these outward signs, we know that person's a born-again Christian. That's what John was thinking. Hello? He was thinking right here, an outward sign of a born-again believer here. How do I know that person's a born-again Christian? Well, because he said he believed on Jesus Christ by faith right there. That's why. How do I know that person is a Christian? Because he's not drinking, he's gambling. Oh, I know that person. You must be a Christian, aren't you? Why, aren't you, why are you praying over your meal? That guy must be a born-again Christian. Why, is it, why aren't you drinking alcohol with us? Because he must be a born-again Christian. See, because of what? He is born of God. He's a born-again person. That's why from these outward things, you know that the person is a born-again Christian. John was not thinking, I mean, are you, when, when you say these simple statements like I do, when lost people say those si simple statements like you do, how do we know that person, you must be a Christian because you do this, because you do that. Do you think that unbelievers and saved Christians and any simple-minded fool and even a little child is thinking, there's a sequential clock going on. Let's grow our beards like John Calvin and drink beer and then look at the scriptures and see there was a clock and a timeline right here. Yes, Judas White, that makes sense. Oh, my good boy, Jeff Durbin, you're right. You, you, you understood that process. What an idiotic, idiotic idiocy. Idiotic idiocy. This is, this is a, only idiots would come up this kind of logic and interpretation. It was a simple statement. They weren't thinking, let's put a clock right here in sequential order. What a... Bleh. Okay, you know how I know this is wrong? Okay, let's look at their author, John, and let's look at other scriptures. How do I know that this is first and then this is second? Not by, let's look at first John and see the clock. No, all you have to do is this. Look at the scriptures and see how that the clock has to contradict on Calvinism. Let's look at, first of all, the author John, John chapter 1. Come on. John chapter 1. You see this Calvinist, that's why, you know, when you do debates with them, you're, you hear arguments that you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way before. Yeah, you're right. You know why? Because these guys deliberately read into a verse that it, the author did not intend. 
John chapter 1. That's why sometimes that when these people debate these Calvinists, they don't like doing it. You know why? Because they're just simply using the verse as it says, whereas Calvinists, they try to go deeper into it and read into it. And so because of that, people are unconfident in debating them. Look at John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him... Okay, so notice right here, you received Jesus Christ first, right? How do you know that's first? Because, look at this, to them gave he power to become the what? Sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. No, God made you become his son. For, no, you of your ability received him first, and then that's why you became born again. You became born into his family. And by the way, this is a sequential clock that our author John was thinking. <laughs> now look at verse 13, the favorite Calvinist phrase, right? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Oh, look at that. At verse 13, see, when you're born of God, when you become his son, you have no free will. It is not of your own will. It is of God's will. They're not using their heads. What did it say first? It didn't say born first, it said receive first. And that's their free choice. Once they use their free choice to receive him, God makes them born again and their own will cannot undo that. And that is all God's will. Amen. There you go. There you go. Oh man, da, da, and da, okay? Oh man. You talk about dumb and dumber. James White and Jeff Durbin. Dumb and dumber, man. These guys are just m together, man. All the way, man. All the way. So you'll notice right here that this is just utter nonsense of the Calvinist. Look what the author John was thinking. By the way, we even looked at the author John in these proof texts of Calvinists too. Do you think it makes more sense that he was thinking a simple statement like everyday people would say what a born-again Christian is? Yes, that seems to make more sense than there is a clock John was thinking here. That you were born first and that because you're born regenerated by the Holy Ghost first, that's why you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that later on. No, he was just giving a simple statement of the outward signs of how you can tell what a born-again person is. You know how I can tell what a born-again person is? When he believes on Jesus Christ for salvation. That's verse. When he's avoiding sin, that's the verse. When he's doing righteous works for Jesus, that's a verse. And that's all the verses. Easy. Not sit down and grow your beard and drink beer at the same time. Oh, my goodness. And then coming up with a deliberate interpretation. What in the world, man? If they want to go by sequential clock, then use John 1, 12 to 13. Now, not only that, this, they can't deny this. Let's look at Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 28. Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Okay, how do we know that it's believing first, then it's you're born again? The reason why is because we looked at John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. And then we're also going to look at Galatians chapter 4. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of what? Promise, right? Okay. So remember right here at Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 through 29, you're the children of promise. This also means, this also means, keep reading verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was what? Born after the spirit. All right, there's your born again by the spirit. And this is all referring to Isaac, right? We are like Isaac, the children of promise. Isaac is the one born after the spirit, correct? Correct. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Why are they born of the Spirit? 
they become the children of promise. Why? Because of Galatians chapter 3. And then notice right here at verse, mm, we'll start off with verse 22. We'll start with verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by what? Faith. faith. Hmm. Okay, promise by faith. Let's uh, go back to Galatians chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 7. Verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of what? Abraham. Okay. Uh, let's look at verse 14. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the what? Promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, this, that's why we're known as the children of promise. Remember, the children of promise, Isaac, the children of Abraham, is born after the Spirit. Based on what? Faith. That's first. How do you know that's first? Because the Bible says at verse 22 that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be what? Given, Given to them that what? Amen. Oh, so how can he give this born again spirit, this promise of being born again into the family to those who don't have faith first? He can't until you have faith. Then he can give it to you. So what do you mean we do this first and then you have faith? Duh. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, that don't make sense to me. You have to have faith first so that you can receive this regeneration. Amen. Now, I'm not going to go through these other verses. If they want to, I can show you more proof text. First Peter. What did the book of 1 Peter say? That we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So we're born again by the word of God. What did Romans chapter 10 say? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the what? Word of God. So you'll notice right here that always born again has to do why? Because we believed first. Calvinists, whenever they look at these passages, they're probably going to try to interpret, knowing their mentality, because I've seen their debates, their logic, their arguments, knowing their mentality, they're going to try to show you it's because the reason why they believed is that they were born again first. They're going to try to keep interpreting that. They're going to try to demand that out of you, that kind of sequential order. If you're going to prove that sequential order, these are the two verses that definitely prove that sequential order of your point. Every other verse that talks about believing regeneration, the, both sides will probably argue back and forth. So the best two verses are this one. It shows that God could not have uh, given the born-again process unless they received this first, unless they had faith first. So that's how you can debunk their arguments right here. What do you do with Calvinism? I'll tell you what you should do with Calvinism. Throw it down the trash can. Amen. That's what you should do. This is, uh, this is just pure, complicated garbage that the authors did not even intend when they were writing. Imagine saying that John taught that, and John is like up in heaven. Wow, that's brilliant. I didn't even come up with that idea when I was writing that. What in the world? That's what Calvinists think. See, they think they're smarter than God. They're smarter than the authors that the, God, that the Lord God has provided for you to give you the scriptures. That's why God did not call Judas White, Jeff Durbin, and all these Calvinist heretics to write his Bible. He called down dumb fishermen, mostly, to write your New Testament. How about that? Of course, God used some scholars here and there. There's no doubt about that. But like Paul argued, who was a scholar himself, that God prefers to use the foolish things, the simple thing, to confound the wisdom of the mighty. So that's what these Calvinists are. They try to act all high and mighty. And you can tell it by the tone of their voice and the air that they give to you when they do debates. But to be very honest, that's not even high and mighty legitimately. They're just amateurs who didn't even graduate from prestigious universities. They didn't even graduate from prestigious universities, let alone get doctorates themselves. So these people, they want to take advantage. They want to take advantage of someone weaker than them. And that disgusts me the most, because I know higher education system a lot. 
So these people who are amateurs and who can even enter a prestigious university, when they act all high and mighty and act like bullies, you disgust me, man. Because I understand that kind of mentality when you're weak yourself.